Hallo, hallo. The day has come that I'm going to discuss with you the solution to this disc problem that has tortured so many of you for almost a week. The solution will come in terms of two different videos. There's a technical reason why I prefer that. This is the first one. And it is a must that you watch this one first before you dive into the second one. Remember, we have two discs. They are identical in all respects. Same thickness. Same wood, that means same density. The only difference is one disc, disc one, radius one, and the other disc, disc two, radius two. There is a thin rod going to the center of each of them, and that thin rod is perpendicular to the surface of the discs. And each disc can rotate freely about that thin rod without any friction. So there's no friction between the discs and the rod. Now, when the problem begins, disc number two is rotating with angular velocity omega in this direction. That is for you counterclockwise. And disc number two, uh, disc number one, is standing still. Now, I will hold the two rods at all moments in time parallel to each other and at the same distance from the floor. You will see that it's going to be important. And now I bring the two rods closer and closer together until they touch. And the friction coefficient between the two discs is mu. Clearly, the circumferential speed of disc number two is omega r2. And the cir circumferential speed of disc one is zero. So, disc number two will slide, so to speak, over the surface of one which stands still. So, there will be a frictional force. And the frictional force is mu, friction coefficient, times the normal force. And the normal force is the one that I provide when I push them against each other. If the normal force is high, then the frictional force will be high. If the normal force is low, the frictional force will be low. But the frictional force on both discs in magnitude is exactly the same. Think of Newton's third law. The frictional force on disc number one is upwards. Because since disc number two is rotating in this direction, this disc number one will start to rotate in this direction. So disc number one will start to rotate clockwise. So the force on disc number one is up. What do you think I have to do to prevent that disc from going up? Right. I have to exert a force on its own rod downwards. Now, how about disc two? Well, the force on disc one is up. Therefore, the frictional force on disc 2 is down. That's why it will spin down. Disc 2 will spin down and disc 1 will spin up. But if the force on disc 2 is down, this rod wants to go down. Ah, Walter Lewin prevents that from happening. So therefore, I apply a force upwards.
So when the system tends to do this, I prevent that from happening, and I mention that very clearly in the video in which I describe the problem. I prevent this from happening, and I hold at all moments in time the rods parallel to each other and at the same distance to the floor. Now, when disc number two, which is rotating, at its surface, at its circumference, I should say, not surface, at its circumference, the speed is omega r2. I hope you can do your homework on that. If it's rotating with angular velocity omega and its radius is r2, the circumference everywhere has a speed omega 2 r2. Uh, sorry, omega r2. Not omega 2. Everywhere the speed is omega r2. Now, the speed at the circumference of this one is zero. So you see now what's going to happen. This one is going to speed up in clockwise direction, and this two is going to slow down in anti-clockwise direction. And then there comes a time that the speed at the circumference of disk number two is exactly the same as the speed at the circumference of disk number one. And when that happens, there is no longer any differential speed between the two surfaces. So that means the friction becomes zero. Remember, the frictional force is only mu times the normal force. If there is motion, relative motion, if you move a piece of wood over the table, the table stands still, the piece of wood is moving, there is a frictional force as long as that piece is moving, there will be a frictional force. The moment that I take my hands off the piece of wood, just put it down on the table and do nothing, frictional force becomes zero. So, at the end phase then, when omega 1 is no longer changing, the angular velocity of disk is no longer changing, and that the angular velocity of disk number 2 is no longer changing, then the friction becomes zero, the angular velocity of disk 1 is then omega 1, and the angular velocity of disk 2 is then omega 2. If there were any friction, if you really insist that there is still friction when I push them against each other, that would mean that there is an angular acceleration of some kind. So omega 1 would change, and omega 2 would change. So we're no longer in that end phase. You know that somehow I think of that end phase as the equilibrium state, which is of course absurd, there is no equilibrium, but it's a nice way to think of it. So when they have reached that end phase, that means when omega 1 r1 is omega 2 r2, then the speeds at the circumference of both disks this is the same, and there is no longer friction. I can keep pushing them against each other. Omega 1 will remain omega 1. Omega 2 will remain omega 2. If I separate them then, omega 1 will remain omega 1, and omega 2 will remain omega 2. So now you may say, well, but the whole thing depends on whether you push very hard, or whether you don't push very hard. That's not the case. That may be a surprise for you, but you will see that in the next video. If I push them very hard against each other, so the normal force is high, that means the frictional force on each one of them is high, then that equilibrium state is reached very quickly.
if I don't push them very hard against each other, that equilibrium state, omega 1 R1 is omega 2 R2, will not be achieved very quickly. The equilibrium state will take a lot longer to reach the equilibrium state. Even if I, at some moments in time, I push hard against each other, and at other moments in time not so hard, and then again harder and then not so hard, the final result for omega 1 and the final result for omega 2 will always be the same. You will see that in the next video. I asked you to tell me what omega 1 is, and I was very specific. I said, what is omega 1 in terms of R1, R2, and omega? I never used the symbol M1. I asked you, what is omega 2 in terms of R1, R2, and omega? I never used the term M2. And the reason why that is not necessary because since the disks have exactly the same thickness, M1 divided by M2 is R1 squared divided by R2 squared. So, I got goose pimples. <laughs> I saw so many solutions with M's all over the place. I think I've heard this introduction now. I've hit this introduction now hard enough. And so, we will now go to the real physics, which is the mass. Oh, by the way, there's something that I should stress. When R2 rubs, when disk 2 rubs on disk number 1, there is friction, right? Well, if I push them hard enough, the heat that is produced by that friction may be so high, I may even smell smoke. They may even start to burn. So the fact that the circumference of 2 slides over the circumference of this 1, and the speeds are different, means heat is produced. So the notion that kinetic energy is conserved in this process is, of course, bizarre. Heat is produced. How about angular momentum? Haha, it's not conserved either. Because I just explained to you that I have to exert all the time a force in this direction on this one to prevent it from going up. And I have all the time, I have to exert a force upwards on this number two to prevent it, uh, yeah, to prevent it from going down. I have to exert an upward force on the rod of disc two and a downward force on the rod of disc one. That means I have to exert a, a torque all the time like this. That means there is an external torque on the system. If there is an external torque, angular momentum is not conserved. So now go to video number two. And when we start that video, all you know is that V1 and V2, that means omega 1, R1, that's the speed as the circumference, is the same as omega 2, R2, then the speeds at the circumferences are the same. That's all you know when we enter problem video number two. And we also know kinetic energy is not conserved and we know that angular momentum is not conserved. All right then, if you're ready for video number two, good luck. And you will see the math. It's not all that difficult. But remember, when I posted the problem in my video, I said 
this problem may not be as easy as you think. Because I knew in advance that many of you would think that angular momentum is conserved, and many of you may even think that kinetic energy is conserved. Therefore, I said, this problem may be a little bit harder than you think. Okay, we will now change to video two, which tells you all you want to know and maybe even more. Have a nice day and take care.